Well, we were looking at uh, the two different forms of transfer of energy, the electrical current using the electrons and the, the uh, molecules or atoms using transfer of, of audio. And I was also looking at the laws of mass and motion where uh, one uh, group of molecules can bump another forward. So we have those type of transfers of energy. But what we want to do now is show you how electric motors work. And this is a very interesting and a very important demonstration piece of equipment. All schools should have a piece of equipment like this in there because it's very understandable and it's very necessary to understand how, uh, elect how electric motors operate. Electric motors do a lot of work for us in, in the world here. There's uh, one thing that I was going to mention before we get into this was the fact that when I first got into working with electromagnetic energy, I was told that if I wanted to get my things accepted, I would have to go through peer review. But it didn't take me long to find out that there are no peers for new discoveries, because if they could see something and judge it and know about it, it wouldn't be a new discovery. So uh, we have to really build our own peers. And basically that's what I'm doing here, is getting this information out and having people look and see it, and uh, if they nod the head the right way, then that uh, makes me real happy because then I know I'm on the right track. Because they are saying, yes, it has to be that way. So let's uh, move into electric motors at this point. Now, here is a piece of equipment, and uh, we're going to talk about Hans Christian Ørsted's right-hand rule. Now, if I take my finger as a conductor, and uh, I say there's a current running in that conductor. I can tell that there is a current running and which way it is running by the right hand rule. And how I do this, uh, I simply put my hand around the conductor and my thumb will point at the source of the electrons, which is uh, where the electrical current is coming from. And, you can and my fingers will point uh, around the wire and a magnetic compass will point around the wire. So with a simple magnetic compass, you can tell that there is a current running in that conductor and which way it is running. So if I have a switch over here, it's a little 12 volt switch. There's a battery charger. And the current is coming out of here. This is the negative side of the battery charger over this side here. It comes out here, goes up over the top of this compass, goes down this, through this loop between these magnets, up over here, it's all in the circuit, goes over to the uh, light here, it goes through the filament of the light, over to the switch and back to the battery charger. When I push on that switch, I'll send a current away. And this, this compass will show that as soon as, I, as soon as I do this, when I push the switch over here, it's a little 12 volt switch. It's a bare switch. So that's the only reason I can touch it. If it was 110, I wouldn't attempt to touch it. But as soon as I push that switch there, this here compass will swing to the, toward the ocean, which is to the west or to my right. And if I pick this up and put it over the top of the wire, it will swing the opposite way. So let's uh, show you Hans Christian Ørsted's right-hand rule. The, that shows the current is coming up over here, down through this here, looping back around. So this is the circuit. So I'll push this right now, and the compass immediately turns to the west. I doubt if you can see this, but uh, uh, it is turning to the west. Now I'll pick it up and the compass is turning to the east, showing that there is, in essence, a circular field in this direction around that wire. When that uh, current goes down through here and gets between this magnets, you have this circular field all the way around this circuit. So when it gets between the magnets, we uh, if we push on the switch, it'll show the wire out like that. That's because the uh, circular field doesn't want to stay in between that straight magnetic field. When you pull two magnets apart like this, you have a kind of straight magnetic field in there. And as you uh, put the circular field in there, it reinforces it on one side and it cancels on the other side, so it kicks the conductor out of there. And that's the whole principle of the electric motor. There's a little simple principle of the rejection of the circular field from the straight magnetic field. Now, there's many forms of magnets. You can have electromagnets, you can have permanent magnets, but 
it all works on the same principle. Now this here current goes over here and lights the light. So if I push on the switch again, the light will light. Now if I push down on the handle of this here magnifying glass, it will bring the light up onto that sort of photovoltaic cell and the little motor will turn. So uh, you can see that uh, the light then is driving that little motor. Now let me do a little explaining here about that. Here we have a single wire, and there's not a very strong thrust in between those magnets. If you want to increase that thrust, you wind up a bundle of wires like this, and that's much, much stronger. Uh, it's this electromagnet, and these are enameled wires, so the current has to go all the way around this coil. And around each one of those wires, there's a little magnetic field formed around individual wires. But they all link together, and they make a longer, a stronger magnet, much stronger than a single wire will do. That's why on the motor, you'll see, we want a coil of wires here. That little cell there sitting on that motor is energizing the coil between the magnets. So uh, it, it kicks it out one way on the top, the other way on the bottom, because the current has to go all the way around, make this circle. And kicks it on the top and the other way on the bottom, and the pivot in the middle, you have a little DC motor. Now, see, here's the magnets are setting each side. So uh, all it takes is to run that current through that coil, and the little motor will turn. Now, that's a fairly simple motor. That motor was invented in Mendocino by Doug Doe and Bob Blick down there. And uh, they showed me one several years ago, about 1991. And I got so interested in them that I've used and have made a lot of these different motors in different forms and shapes. But they all work on the same principle. Now, let's uh, run another smaller motor here. He's here, uh, little jumper wires are very obvious what I'm doing, so I call them high-tech hookups because they are uh, so obvious you can just tell anybody can recognize what I'm doing there. But uh, I'm going to run this little motor right here, so if you can take a good look at that little motor, you'll see it operate. That's about as small a motor as you can get as far as I'm concerned. It's just single loop interacting with that magnet there. But they all work on the same principle. Now over here we have another situation, a little different. Here the coils are turning and the magnets are sitting still. Let's set the coils still and see if we can make the magnets turn. So I'll get over here a little closer and uh, this magnet here, if I turn this magnet, it affects the next one to it. Simply the magnetic connection between the two to doing that. So I'm going to push the switch down and see if we can spin this magnet. This is the one that's going to do the driving and this is the one that's just going to be a, a following, following along on it. So let's see how that works out. Okay, I'm push the switch down and I'm going to turn the magnet to see if it gets you notice the coils are sitting still and the magnets are turning. We just reversed the situation from the motor we first saw over here. It's kind of interesting to recognize you can reverse the situation that way. So we'll uh, come back up here where we were. Now, there's one thing I like to ask you people at this point. Uh, and that is, what is the size of a photon of white light? And I'm not asking you to answer that, I'm just asking you to that you think about it. How would you measure the size of a photon of white light? That's the mid-range of white light. So knowing how antennas operate, all magnetic fields are uh, one half wavelength in diameter. So all you have to do to know the size of a photon of white light is to is to look up in your physics book to get the wavelength of light, and all radiator fields are one half wavelength in diameter. So 
mid-range of white light you'll find is about one fifty thousandths of an inch. That means the little photons of white light mid-range are about one one hundred thousandths of an inch. In other words, a hundred thousand of them side by side would extend about an inch. That gives you a size. It's a relatively close size. It's, when I say about, I mean it's about because I'm not into precise engineering here, but I'm trying to show how things operate. Now, the, uh, the next thing I like to ask is, what is the temperature of a photon of white light? And of course people say, well, it's hot. And they say about the photon being tiny. But the uh, way I describe the temperature of a photon of white light, I take an iron rod, uh, just an imaginary iron rod here, and I have a torch. And I'm going to heat that iron rod. Well, the first thing it's going to do is give off uh, infrared, which is a, a range that our eyes are not tuned for. Uh, probably some of the fields are too large even to go through the pupil of a person's eye. But everything you see has to go through the pupil of your eye, focus on the retina, and that retina is nothing more or less than a field of antennas that are designed for the particular size of the photons that we're working with. So they're basically designed for uh, the, the mid-range of, of a range of white light from the blue-violet spectrum to the red spectrum. So anyway, uh, that is the, uh, when we're heating this iron, if we start heating it, it'll radiate infrared. We can't see infrared, but we can see it with our nerve endings or our fingers. You can tell it's giving off heat. If I continue to heat this iron, it'll, it'll turn red. And uh, if I continue to heat it some more, you're activating the electrons like I was showing you in the, in the atom demonstration over there. You're activating those electrons to a higher frequency. And so the yellow light gets involved. And the, the red and the yellow make orange. The iron will turn orange. And you continue to heat it even more. And the blue-violet end of the spectrum comes in, becomes involved in this here. And the three colors make white light. Continue to heat it even still more, and you can expand those atoms to where they become metallic vapor, and you can just see right through them. Now, going back to the uh, temperature then of a photon of white light, it's just simply white hot. You know, we speak of red hot, we speak of white hot, we don't often speak of blue hot, but we know that the blue part of the flame is the hottest part. So, uh, the photons then are about one one hundred thousandths of an inch in diameter. They're very tiny little things, hundred thousand of an extended inch. And the temperature, the mid-range of white light is about, uh, it's just plain white hot. Uh, the, uh, when they come down to Earth, about 25% of the energy from the sun is used up heating the atmosphere. But the rest of them come clear down to the Earth. We wouldn't see white light. And uh, we see all the colors that's created in white light if it wasn't white hot. In other words, if the photons were simply just red hot when they got here, all we would see is red out there. We wouldn't see any white, white colors or all the whites and blues and all the different colors involved in the spectrum. So how can we prove that those uh, little photons are white hot? Well, all energy fields are little spherical fields and they start from a point source. So we have this here uh, inverse square law where they spread out by the, uh, inversely squared to the distance. And so they're, they're spread apart when they get here. Now, how can you prove that? Well, let's take a big magnifying glass and let's get them back together at a focal point under that magnifying glass and see how hot they are. If we get them back to the concentration of the surface of the sun, you will have the heat of the surface of the sun right at that focal point. So uh, that brings up another subject. We all have access into a, a nuclear reactor up in the sky. And uh, it's 93 million miles away. It's at a safe distance. We don't have to worry about uh, atomic pollution. We don't have to, uh, it, if it's got any, if it's any hotter, if it's sent it any more concentrated uh, energy down here, we couldn't stand it. It has to be spread out. We have to be. Uh, about this temperature. That's what our bodies and everything were designed for, to handle that temperature. Even in the deserts, it's pretty hard to handle the temperature from the sun. So uh, 
we have this access to this nuclear reactor, you can go into your own backyard and you can build a big magnifying glass or a, a big solar collector and send that little photon to a focal point and you could uh, create the temperature of the sun right in your own backyard. Now, when they take energy from an atomic plant, they don't, uh, they can say they don't uh, uh, use solar cells, they uh, heat water. And when the water is heated, it has a terrific expansion. And so they create steam with this here uh, nuclear reactors. And they run this through a steam turbine and generate electricity with the expansion of this water into steam. Now, water, when it expands into steam, it expands about 1,100 times its volume. But if it goes clear to vapor, it would be about 1,700 times its uh, uh, volume as it would as a liquid of water. So uh, anybody who would want to make a little solar reactor should be able to uh, make some kind of a, uh, access to the, to the sun with a simple a little steam turbine in their own backyard. There's another thing about the sun, too. We don't have to worry about uh, atomic meltdowns, like atomic plants and things like that. But the actual fact is it is melting down. And the only salvation we have there is that it's going to take about four billion years for it to complete the meltdown from hydrogen atoms to, to neutrons. Because as I told you earlier, a uh, neutron is simply an electron and a proton attached to each other. And if it can get rid of the heat, they can create neutrons. The sun doesn't have any trouble getting rid of heat because it's sending it out and it's not receiving anything back. But it's hard to make neutrons on Earth because it's hard to find a place where you can uh, get rid of heat and not get some back. And as long as you have that some heat coming back, those little electrons are going to be active and you're going to have the hydrogen atom. Okay, now let's, let's review what's taking place. I have a coil here and a piece of a conductor. If I run a current through here, I get a circular field around that conductor. If I wind that conductor up into a coil, I still have a circular field around these individual wires. But they all link together and make a stronger magnetic field. So uh, the magnetic field would come on the outside here and back through the center of this coil around the outside and back through the center, all the way around it, not just on the top. And that would be then an electromagnet. But the important part is that they, they link together and make a stronger magnetic field. Now at the time, I've been saying this for many years, in fact it's a well-known uh, thing, but at that time I did not know that these fields not only link together, but they pull together. They want to pull that, that coil together that way. And that was an important observation because when you send off water from a hose, it leaves in a sheet of water. And you put your thumb down on top of that and that sheet of water will squirt out here. But each one of those little molecules have a directional velocity and they'll eventually separate into little triplets. And when those little triplets are formed, they form in little orbs. But when radiated energy is sent off, what pulls them into, a, into an orb? a regular shape into a perfect spherical shape. It had to be something that pulled those in because they're just pure magnetic fields. So uh, I have a little demonstration here that will show that how that pulling together takes place. And it does take place with the magnetic fields. And they have to pull into a spherical shape for a satellite dish to work. There's no other shape will go into a satellite dish and, and always go to a focal point. So I'm going to hook up this here little spring here and uh, run a current through it. I think I better put my glasses on. I can see a little better with them. I can focus in on this here. Okay. Now I'm going to do something here. This current was going through a filament here, which was a resistor, and it was a it cut the current down. I'm going to bypass that resistor and I'm going to uh, give it just one one shot. So I want you to focus on this here uh, spring. Get a good close focus on that spring. Get people watching that. See what we're going to do. And I'm only going to touch it one time because I don't want to burn my battery charger up. 
So if you're ready to watch it, I'm going to put it right now. Notice how that spring just pulls together, it just collapses. But when those fields are sent off, those magnetic fields pull into that spherical shape for that, for that same reason. Here they, uh, they link together, but they also pull together. When they're driven off, they'll, they'll form that spherical shape. Now, other things form spherical shapes too, but for different reasons. I want to show you how little spheres are formed with bubbles. And you see you have a whole bunch of bubbles. They pull in little spherical shapes. But that's not the same principle as pulling those together as the, just magnetic fields. But it's very common and very natural for things to be pulled into a spherical shape. Now here we have a uh, couple of magnets here, and I want to show you how they work. One is an electromagnet and one is a permanent magnet. I'll have to bring this over to here. Now, you watch that this magnet right here. Get a good close look at those. You'll see what's taking place here. Notice how they pull together. If I turn them around the other way, They'll repel. One way they repel, one way they attract. This is a coil of copper wire. When I'm running a current through it, the only thing I can be doing with that current is arranging the interior of those atoms. And so when they are arranged that way, the current, say, was going in from this side, they repel the electrons away. Uh, from the source of the electrons, and they pull the protons toward the source of the electrons because they're one's a negative charge, one's a positive charge. And the, uh, like I said, the interior of those atoms are vacuumed, and they have a lot of space in there. And uh, so those electrons and the nucleus can be arranged very readily inside this here model of the atom, the spring atom. With the atom where they orbit the electrons, uh, you uh, can't arrange the interior of that atom because uh, it uh, has to, the nucleus has to stay dead center and it, it can't uh, permit the electrons, the electrons have to go around it. So the electrons have to go around the nucleus and so uh, this atom, you can arrange it anywhere you want with outside forces and that's why this has a, a big advantage over the uh, orbiting model of the atom. In fact, that orbiting model can't operate anyway. There's a lot of other uh, fallacies involved with it. So what I say then is happening is that your magnetism is simply an arrangement inside the atom. And it's not a force that you can take unlimited force from. It's simply a tool, uh, a range tool that uh, can be used from many different ways. I want to show you something about friction. And so in order to show that, this little piece of equipment will show that too. I'm going to put a little bolt underneath there to make that light stay on. And I'm going to push this down to get it to run. I'm going to have to get a little weight on that. A little figure something out here. That ought to do it. And I'm running that wheel over there. And I'm going to come over to the other side here and show you something about friction. Got to kind of squeeze in here. And here we have a aluminum wheel and a uh, brass shaft, so it has nothing to do with iron, and these are a couple of magnets. And if I put that up close to the wheel, you see the wheel slow down. I'm not touching it. If I touch the wheel, you'd hear it. So it slows it way down. Now if I take 
put two of them on, one on each side, it'll slow it down even more, because then it's working from both sides. Now putting them on so they want to pull together these magnets. This magnetic brake actually is what it amounts to. Now the interesting thing is if I turn them around so these fields oppose each other, they just flatten out those fields. They don't cross into the next field. And so if I put them there and put the wheel right in the middle, it uh, won't slow it down because it's not cutting through the lines of portion of the magnetic field. It just keeps spinning. Now I'm going to come back around here and we'll kind of review what we were seeing here. I'll shut the motor down. And what's taking taking place there is that when a, when a metallic surface is cutting through a magnet, this being a magnet, if it's cutting through those magnets like that, the, um, it induces a current into this here metallic surface, this being a, a conductor like that wheel there. It induces a current into that conductor. When the current runs, it forms a uh, magnetic field around this path. And um, the magnetic field is, that is formed opposes the field that formed it. And so it creates a resistance to the movement of this uh, conductor going through this between these magnets. Not really between them, I guess it's going just across the magnetic field. If I pull them apart, it would be going between them and do the same thing. But uh, it's uh, a current is induced into the surface that creates a uh, magnetic field around its path that opposes the field that formed it. And that's what I believe all of friction is about. They, uh, has been some doubts about whether they really know what friction is. And to me, it, that is what friction is. It's the resistance of, uh, of induced into a metallic surface cutting through the magnetic lines of force of a magnet. Now, with this here uh, ma magnet, or this atom model, you can arrange that in any shape you want. And so if you arranged it so that it was uh, uh, if it's just a random shape, we'll say it, you, a magnetic compass can't uh, detect random magnetism. I went uh, up to what was known as the Titlow Ski Lift and got some ore one time, a kind of a rock on at heart, and uh, I got some green ore that I was pretty sure was copper. I also got some black ore that I thought was hematite or iron ore. And I said, well, there's no problem there. I'll just take a compass and I'll prove to myself if it's iron ore or not. So I took the compass and put it over by this black ore, and it didn't say it was iron ore. It wasn't affected by the ore at all. But it still looked like iron ore to me, so I kept puzzled about it. And I finally picked up a magnet and went across this iron ore with the magnet, arranged the, the molecules in there, the interior of those atoms and molecules in that iron ore. Now it attracts the compass. In other words, a compass cannot detect random magnetism. Now, if you go into the Encyclopedia Britannica, you'll find that the Curies, the Madame Curie and that group, did a lot of work with uh, magnetism. And they say that all elements will retain permanent magnetism if they're kept below the Curie temperature. Now, the Curie temperature of steel is about 770 degrees uh, centigrade. So it will retain permanent magnetism at room temperature, but the copper will go to random at room temperature. So as long as the current is flowing, you have a magnetic uh, condition, you have the, mag the atoms, the interior of them arranged in a magnetic uh, one way or the other. But uh, as soon as you stop the current, they just go to random and the compass can't recognize random magnetism. So I believe each atom is a magnet. And if you have a, if I put my hand down on a table like this, if I put my hand down on a table like that, the uh, molecules of my hand uh, are in contact with the molecules of the table. But each one of those is random. There's no 
uh, orientation, because neither my hand nor the table will take up uh, permanent magnetism, except that there's low temperature. So, but I still, when I try to move my hand, I get a resistance to it. And I believe that's the, the resistance of the molecules, the magnetic fields in the molecules of my hand uh, trying to move across the molecules of the table. The electrons and, and molecules right on the surface there, you can actually rub off electrons with a, with a silk or with your hand or something like that so you can create a static electricity in your hand. So that's the way I look at it is that magnetism is simply an arrangement inside the atom and, uh, and most things are random magnetism uh, unless they're magnetized and kept below the Curie temperature. I want to show you how uh, the magnetic field looks around a magnet. You can't see the magnetic field because they're totally transparent. You can run a laser beam right through a magnetic field that doesn't deviate it at all. But uh, anyway, around a single, a simple magnet like this with a magnetized north pole on one side and south pole on the other, the field will look something like that. They go through the center and around the outside. And so that gives you a little visual picture of what the magnetic fields would look like if you could see them. Now I want to show you a couple of other little motors here, different kinds. And one of them is a little motor that is timed by the power company clock, the PG&E clock. And uh, if I push down the switch, I'll put an alternating current into this here coil. So the, coil, the current flows one way and creates a magnetic field. It goes back the other way and creates the reverse magnetic field. And so if I push down the switch and uh, this magnet, every time that field changes, reverses direction, the magnet has to flip over. So if I push down the switch like this here, you can see that little wheel's going to turn. Have to turn it as fast as it got going. It has to go with the time 60 cycle current, so it has to be timed with it. There's no way of changing that timing unless you change the frequency of the current. But it's a, a little motor that's synchronized by the PG&E clock. You notice it didn't have to have any uh, commentator and whatnot on it. Now here's a, uh, a DC motor, and it has a commentator because it would only go one half turn, and then you have to reverse the current, so it goes the second half of the turn. And so I have a little commentator down in there where uh, these brushes are running on, a, on the wires that come out from the end of the, uh, these coils. And so if I push on the switch here, yeah, see if this will run here. Now, I've never run this motor fast as it'll turn. I don't know whether it fly apart or not. It's just something I made to demonstrate with. But it uh, really spins up there. That gives you a little idea about some of the varieties of motors you could make. And uh, next thing we'll do is to go into uh, radiation, radiated fields. So uh, we'll just, uh, in order to continue with what we're doing here, I want to kind of re recap some of the things we were recognizing. So here we have two magnets made of wood. They're just models of magnets. And these broom straws represent the uh, lines of force between those magnets. So if I cut across these lines of force, I get a little resistance. And that resistance ends up as a current running in this rod. When a current runs, it forms a magnetic field around this path, and it resists the movement through those, that magnetic field. Now, I'm recognizing that as friction today. I didn't uh, several years ago, but this seems to be the answer to friction. It's the resistance of the one field of being a, uh, that opposes the field that's forming it. It doesn't make a difference whether the rod is moving through the field or the field is moving over the rod. So if we had a uh, transmission from a television station, that field crosses the rod and induces a current in the rod. So let's uh, say I'm going to induce 
uh, alternating current. I'd go back and forth, I'd be creating an alternating current in this rod. That'd be a generator. Now if I put this in here, and there's no action, no movement, I get no, nothing out. In other words, no energy in, no energy out, as far as I can see. And uh, if I go up and down with the lines of force, I get no resistance, uh, because I'm not cutting across the lines of force. And it also does not create a current, so I have to cut across the lines of force to create the current in the rod. So if I put the rod in there again, in between these magnets, and I run a current through this rod now, the current's going this way, we'll say we get a circular field around this rod, and that circular field reinforces the magnetic field on this side, and, uh, and it cancels on this other side, so that it kicks that rod right out of there kicks the field and the rod with it. And that is the principle of the electric motor. That's the whole basis for the electric motor. You saw it happening in that little swinging arm over there. You saw the circular field with that compass. And uh, there's another thing that takes place though beyond that. And that is if you run a current in a conductor, and I'm using my, this end of this rod as a conductor because I'm now thinking in terms of the down link of the satellite signal and uh, the C band, which is a four gigahertz frequency, and one four billionth of a second, that's what gigahertz stands for, one four billionth of a second, light can travel three inches, and the current travels almost as fast. Uh, so I won't uh, get into the difference in the speed of current at this point, we'll just say that it's traveling the speed of light. But the, the current goes here and hits the end of the rod, and that's as far as it can go, so it comes back and goes, back this way. So the three inches then is there and back. And when it uh, does that, it forms a field going one way, and when it comes back, it forms an opposing field inside that first field that drives it off. And so it's a pure magnetic field leaving that conductor like that, 90 degrees to the direction of the electrical current running in the conductor. There's no electrical component traveling with that magnetic field. It's traveling as a pure magnetic field, and the electrical uh, current is staying with the electrons in the conductor. I know of no way of getting the electrical charge away from the electrons, but there's a very good way of driving the magnetic field off, and it's driven off by a, uh, an opposing field. So it's driven off 90 degrees to the direction of the, of the uh, current running back and forth in the conductor. And if that's like, say, 4 gigahertz frequency, all those fields will come up, they'd be an inch and a half in diameter which is exactly the size of a ping pong ball. 